All right, guys, today we're talking about what's called kinetic molecular theory. If you guys think about it, kinetic has to do with motion. Molecular, obviously, referring to molecules, and it's a theory. It's a theory in regards to how molecules move. The only reason why it's called a theory is because we can't directly observe molecular motion, but based upon experimental evidence, we can devise a theory which would help explain how molecules move. Got a little riddle for you guys. What do you get if you divide the circumference of your jack-o'-lantern by its diameter? Take the circumference of it. Divided by its diameter, you guys know what it is, it's pumpkin pie, that's what you get from that. Okay, here, here you guys, we have a gas molecule. Kind of look at how it's uh, theorized to move. Continuously change its course as a result of collisions with the walls of the container. Okay, so how do gas, how are, how are molecules, uh, um, expected to move. You guys see, hopefully you guys recognize, they move in a straight line, right? Notice they're moving in a straight line until it hits the walls of the container, then it moves, then it changes. It's also moving randomly. It's not like it's purposely going to a certain area, it's just moving randomly. Okay, so it's moving in a straight line, it's moving randomly. And then what else you should notice is, you notice when it hit the walls of the container, it didn't slow down. That's kind of different than what we would normally expect. You think about it, if I run into a wall, right, I could be running really fast, and then I hit the wall, and then I slow down. Why do I slow down? Because I transfer some of my kinetic energy to the wall. In this case, the molecule doesn't slow down. It maintains the same kinetic energy, uh, assuming the same temperature. So these are some characteristics of molecular motion. Obviously, this would show a lot of gas molecules. The paths of gas particles are very erratic. Particles continuously change direction and velocity as a result of collisions with other particles and with the walls of the container. So the difference here is they're obviously colliding with other molecules as well as the walls of the container. You guys, here's uh, two terms that a lot of people tend to confuse, and um, they're not necessarily the same thing, though there obviously is a relationship. It's between pressure and force. Let me explain the difference between pressure and force, because a lot of times when we're talking about gases, we're talking about pressure that it exerts. For example, let's say I have my finger here, and then let's say I'm going to apply a force with my finger against the palm of my hand. Okay, So my finger is applying a force to the palm of my hand, okay? All right? So now compare that, compare that. I'm doing it with all my might. I'm doing it, okay? Now, let's say I do the exact same thing, but this time with a sharpened pencil. So I made sure to sharpen it really sharp, okay? So I'm gonna do the same thing with the pencil. Okay, uh, that was a little exaggerated. Um, but, okay, so what was the difference here? You guys, in both scenarios, what was the same? Wasn't it the force, because I used all the force I could with my, with my right arm. So the force was the same, but what was different? Why with my finger would it not penetrate my hand, but the pencil tip would penetrate the, the hand? Because what was different was the area over which that force was applied. Look at the first scenario, let's do this. Let's just, I'm not gonna, we'll make it really easy, we won't use any units. Let's say a force of eight was applied. And let's say the tip of my finger is four, um, let's say millimeters squared. So I would divide it by the area, and you guys see what the pressure would be? The pressure is the force divided by the area. It's the force applied over an area. The pressure in this case would be a two. So I'm applying a pressure of two, and just don't worry about units at this point. Now compare that with, with the pencil tip. Once again, what's the force? It's the same force, the same force that I'm using with my right hand. But now, that force is applied over a much smaller area, let's say the area is over one millimeter squared. And what obviously the pressure eight divided by one would be eight. And you guys see the pressure is much greater. So when you have the same force applied over a, a lower, uh, a smaller area, the result is a greater pressure. So hopefully you guys are seeing the difference between pressure and force. Okay. How do gases exert pressure? Okay, think about it, think about the, the little video we just saw. Gases exert pressure by collisions. They're colliding with the walls of the container. In fact, you guys, the, uh, the air is surrounding you and it's exerting a pressure on you as those air molecules are uh, hitting the surface of your body. So if I wanted to increase pressure, let's say I had a box, right? And I had gas in it. How, think about it, how could, and there's gas molecules in it, moving randomly, straight line, right? There's elastic collisions, meaning they don't lose energy as they're hitting the walls of the container. How could I increase the pressure 
of the gas inside the box. Some of you guys know, what could I do? Oh, you know what, that's actually my second one. Yeah, no, actually the first one. What could we do? Couldn't we heat it up? Because wouldn't you guys agree, if it's at increased temperature, that indicates the average kinetic energy or the motion of the molecules is uh, greater. Imagine molecules moving faster. Not only do they hit the walls of the container more frequently, but they're gonna hit it with more force, thus exerting a greater pressure. And then what else could we do? Can you guys agree, what could we do? Couldn't we just pump more uh, molecules into that, into that container? That's essentially what you guys are doing when you're pumping up a tire, right? You're putting in, you're pumping in, you're putting in more air molecules into that tire, and then it's creating a greater pressure and that keeps the tire inflated. Okay, you guys, high temperature, low temperature, predict what would be different when I start the video. Gas molecules are in constant okay. motion and frequently collide with one another. Although not all the molecules in a gas sample move at the same speed, the higher the temperature of the gas, the greater the average speed and kinetic energy of the molecules overall. So I think you guys predicted that. This higher level of energy allows molecules to disperse more readily, which is one reason we smell aromas better when temperatures are higher. Right, so you're gonna smell your mama's cooking in the heat of summer, probably a lot in, in another room, probably a lot easier than you would in winter because in the higher temperatures, those particles of food which are traveling in the air are gonna be traveling much faster and hit your nose much quicker and more frequently. Okay, check this out. Here we have water. This demonstration illustrates the characteristics of steam under two different temperature conditions. Well, boiling water. Initially, traveling water through is this coil. Flask and allowed to pass through a coil. I don't know if you guys can see, tubing. it's uh, fogging up right when here because the, the steam is, is coming out. The, of the, tubing, the water condenses to liquid in the beaker. If a match is placed into the steam coming out of the copper tube, nothing happens. You almost say, well, duh. That's like water vapor. Why is it going to light a match? And then they take some steel wool. If a piece of steel wool is placed into the stream, there is no observable change in the steel wool. Wouldn't you guys agree? That was a pretty sucky video. So you kind of have you set up and then like nothing happens. Okay, so now let's do something different. Now, they actually have this coil here over a Bunsen burner. Bunsen burners are what we have in the lab. They're going to light the Bunsen burner. I don't know if you guys can see it. They're going to start it up. The steam to a very high temperature. So now the flame. The steam still condenses to liquid water in a beaker. You still have the water traveling through. The, the, the vapor is traveling through. So you can see there's water vapor collecting in that, that beaker. Now look what, look what happens. A match placed into the superheated steam ignites. You, remember that? you guys when see what lit that match? Placed in the superheated it was water steam, vapor. The steel wool grows brightly and reacts with the steam. Reaction with superheated steam can cause metal pipes in electric power plants to corrode and wear out. You guys, what you should realize with this is, that's why you got to actually be more careful with steam than you do with boiling water. Because you think about boiling water, what's the, what's the hottest boiling water can get? is in 100 degrees Celsius, because any hotter, those molecules escape. How hot can steam get? Pretty, it can get indefinitely hot, as long as you keep heating it. You guys see the point of the Bunsen burner, or the point of the coils? The coils allow that, that, uh, that water vapor to stay uh, over the uh, Bunsen burner for a longer period of time, so it can build up uh, but higher temperatures such that it can actually light the match and even ignite steel wool. So you can get exceedingly high temperatures. Question I have for you though is, so really there's pretty much no maximum temperature you can reach. You know, think about the hottest temperature you can get, like the surface of the sun, and then just go a degree hotter, right? Question I have for you, is there such thing as a minimum temperature? So there's really no such thing as a maximum temperature, but is there such thing as a minimum temperature? Let's, end, let's see uh, if that's true. The dual flask or thermos contains liquid nitrogen at a temperature of 77 kelvins. The balloon has been blown up with air. This is about negative 200 degrees Celsius right here. This uh, nitrogen, which is normally a gas, and now it's liquefied by bringing it down. Look what it does to the balloon.
guys see what happened to it. Put it on the balloon. What that caused the, the gas molecules in the balloon to slow down extremely slow. They're exerting less pressure. The balloon deflated. But now, as the uh, liquid nitrogen evaporated away, the temperature of the balloon starts going up. Molecules start moving faster, colliding more with more force, thus inflating the balloon. Okay, so that is liquid nitrogen. All right. Still haven't really answered the question, is there such thing as a minimum temperature? Okay, but get this. You know that Celsius and centigrade are the same thing, so that's degrees Celsius. Okay, that's what we mean when we say degrees Celsius. You could call it either one. But a question I have for you is, is the Celsius scale an absolute measure of temperature? You're like, what the heck kind of question is that? Here, I got a little demonstration. Let's, uh, um, here, let's, uh, what we want to do is, I kind of want you guys to make a little graph. And on the vertical axis, you have pressure. And then on the horizontal axis, you have temperature in degrees Celsius. We want to answer the question, is the Celsius temperature scale an absolute measure of temperature? So in order to do this, let's, uh, let's say, so here I have you guys, I have a pressure gauge. Basically, there's just air in the steel ball. And then what this, <coughs> and this is perfect, uh, specifically done without units just to make it uh, really simple. So then this gauge here is measure, measuring the pressure of the gas inside this steel ball. So, and why is the, uh, why is the gas in, or the air inside the steel ball exerting a pressure? Aren't the gas molecules moving? They're hitting the walls of the container and that's what this gauge is measuring. So what is the pressure? So, and what temperature am I at right now? You guys, unless you're told otherwise, isn't it room temperature? Room temperature is probably about 20 or so degrees Celsius. You know, most of us are, we're, we're used to Fahrenheit, but Celsius is uh, definitely a lot more universally um, uh, used for temperature. So anyways, I would say the pressure of the gas at room temperature is 15, um, is 15. So let's say it's in pounds per square inch. So what I would do is I could go over here on this axis, let's say this is zero, and then I would go to 22 degrees Celsius and then put a, a, a data point at uh, 15 uh, pounds per square inch in pressure, right? Now let's change the temperature, okay? So in this case, I don't know if you guys can see here. Let me see if you guys can see it. Yeah, you can. Here I have boiling water. It's almost boiling, okay? So now I'm going to submerge my pressure gauge into the boiling water so that the boiling water is surrounding and then I want you guys to predict, what do you guys think you would expect to happen to the pressure? Okay, so let's put it in. So now it's in the boiling water. And hopefully you guys can see the pressure gauge. If you can't, I'm gonna bring it over to you guys. Um, you guys might have rightfully predicted that the pressure would increase. If you guys look right now, it's in the pressure around 18, something like that. And as expected, wouldn't you guys expect the pressure to increase um, due to the fact that the temperature is going up, molecules are now, they're, they're absorbing thermal energy from the surroundings, the, uh, they're going to increase in kinetic energy, um, and therefore exert more pressure. So, then that would be, and if that was at boiling, you guys know the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius, so at about 100 degrees Celsius, I'd put like a pressure of 18. Okay, and then I could do that with several other things, like for example, let's say I plot some points, so this was at 100 degrees Celsius, it had a higher pressure, and then this, let's say this was at room temperature, and it had a pressure of 15. Then what could I do? I could, I actually don't have ice right now because the school's closed, um, but I could put it in an ice bath, which would be close to zero degrees Celsius, and um, it would have a pressure. What would you guys expect at a lower temperature when you expect even a lower pressure? And then, then what I could even do is, I could even, now at this point I couldn't use water anymore because what's the coldest that water could get? You know, if I was gonna submerge it, isn't it zero degrees Celsius? Because at zero degrees Celsius, then the water freezes. But then I could use a different liquid, like acetone. I could use acetone, which has a much lower uh, freezing point, and then use carbon dioxide, uh, a dry ice, to get it really, really cold, and I could get it like negative 77, negative 70 degrees Celsius, and then I would expect, you know, and obviously you would want to do this uh, experimentally, and then uh, plot data points. So at this point, the question still stands, is the Celsius scale an absolute measure of temperature? By absolute, when you think about it, guys, what is temperature measured? Temperature measures the average kinetic energy of the molecules. And what's kinetic energy refer to? The motion of the molecules. And so I'm asking you guys, does, is there such thing as a minimum temperature? The answer to that is yes. And why is that? Because what's the lowest possible temperature? The point at which all molecular motion stops. Wouldn't you guys agree that that you can't get any lower temperature than uh, no molecular motion if temperature is a measure of the kinetic energy and thus the molecular motion. So, looking at this, is the Celsius scale an absolute measure of temperature? 
If it's an absolute measure of temperature, what should zero degrees Celsius correspond to? Shouldn't it correspond to zero pressure? Because if all molecular motion is stopped, there's no molecules moving around to collide with the walls of the container to exert pressure. So is the answer to that question, yes or no, is an absolute measure of temperature? Hopefully you guys realize the answer is no. And what's our, what's our experimental evidence for that? You see at zero degrees Celsius, this is zero degrees Celsius, by the way, right? Here, in, in fact, this would be like zero degrees, this is like 20 degrees, sorry. It might have helped if I had put this here. So this was all collecting to me, this is like negative 70 degrees or something like that. Um, you see, at zero degrees Celsius, what do we notice? Oh, what would you guys do next? You guys know usually when you, when you see a, a pattern, what are you gonna do? You're gonna continue that pattern. And what do we see? At zero degrees Celsius, there is an observable pressure. So even if this was at zero degrees, if there is an observable pressure, what, is that, what must that mean? The molecules are still what? Still moving. So Celsius is not an absolute measure of temperature. So what you guys think, what we could do is, so the question is, how could I use the graph like this to ultimately figure out what is the lowest possible temperature? What is the temperature at which all molecular motion stops? That's the lowest potential. What do you guys think you would do? Well, wouldn't you guys agree, the lowest possible temperature is the temperature at which all molecular motion stops. When all molecular motion has stopped, it is zero pressure, so what could you do? Wouldn't you guys just continue to carry this out all the way until what? Until the pressure is zero, and then see what the corresponding temperature is. That is called absolute zero. Just so you guys know, here is the coldest possible temperature. Absolute zero is negative 273 uh, degrees Celsius. You guys, we also call it absolute zero. You guys, uh, the absolute temperature scale we'll typically use and the scientific community uses globally is the Kelvin scale. Negative 273 degrees Celsius. And you guys remember, remember this is the coldest possible temperature. So if we're going to use an absolute uh, temperature scale, this value should be zero. And so what do we call it? We call it zero Kelvin. And you guys see this is negative 273 degrees Celsius is zero Kelvin. So if this is zero Kelvin, negative 273 degrees Celsius, what do you guys think zero Celsius will be Kelvin? You know what? It's a pretty easy conversion. All you do is add 273. In fact, that's what I want you guys to write down. If you guys are going to convert, uh, you take your uh, Celsius value, and all you do is add 273 to get, um, to get the, the corresponding Kelvin temperature. And you guys see how it would work? What's the lowest possible temperature? Negative 273. What's negative 273 plus 273? Isn't it zero? So negative 273 degrees Celsius is zero Kelvin. All right. So you guys, when we talk Kelvin from now on, now you should know what we're talking about. It's the absolute temperature scale because zero Kelvin does mean what you would expect it to mean, zero molecular motion. It says, ah, ah, it's worse than I thought. I want you to take one of these every two hours. What are they? Breath mints. Okay. All right, almost done here, guys. When we do PATM, you guys should know Big P refers to pressure, and when we say ATM, that's kind of the abbreviation for the atmosphere. Because the atmosphere is exerting a pressure, we call it the pressure of the atmosphere. It's also known as barometric pressure. In fact, they use this to even predict weather patterns. You guys might see on the Weather Channel or something like that, they might say the barometric pressure is, and then that can allow you to know if a storm's coming. Usually a lower pressure would indicate, you know, a storm's coming, higher pressure would uh, uh, indicate that that's not the case. Okay, here's, here's kind of something that's unique. We measure atmospheric pressure, oftentimes in what's called millimeters of mercury. You're like, what? Isn't mercury with that, that silver metal uh, liquid? Uh, millimeter, and isn't millimeter a, a length? So how do we measure pressure in millimeters of mercury? And so that comes from, look at how we, uh, a typical uh, barometer is made. A barometer is a, a device used to measure pressure. Check out how it's made. The Torricelli barometer, invented by Evangelista Torricelli in 1643, is made by first filling a dish with mercury. I see how cool mercury is, liquid metal, room temperature. Mercury is then poured into a long tube. Notice she was holding, she had gloves on, mercury is a toxic uh, is material. You wouldn't even want it to seep into your pores of your skin. That's why we don't even use mercury in chemistry classrooms anymore. Stafford. and inverted several times. 
to remove air bubbles. So we used to have right, our thermometers and other things would be made out of mercury, but for student safety, they've removed mercury thermometers from the classroom because it's a toxic metal and it can seep in the pores of your skin. So then, basically, she's filling up this whole tube with mercury, okay? The tube is then completely filled with mercury using a dropper. Making sure there's no air in it at all. So filling up every available space. A finger is placed over the top of the tube and the tube is inverted. Okay, and this is a dish of mercury, I don't know if you can see it. The and then she just removes her finger. When the finger is removed, the level of the mercury, mercury drops. inside the tube drops until the pressure at the bottom of the mercury column is equal to the pressure exerted by the surrounding air. So you guys see. Since no air is allowed to enter the tube, the empty space above the mercury column is a vacuum. Notice there's no air in here. We can measure the pressure exerted by the atmosphere by measuring how high the mercury column rises above the level of the mercury in the dish. This is where that unit millimeters of mercury comes the pressure from. You, is measure, millimeters of you mercury. measure the length of mercury that the atmospheric pressure supports. Here, let me uh, show you guys another schematic that I want you guys to copy down. Okay, guys, just draw this uh, simple. This is going to help you guys on the uh, assignment that goes with this uh, particular um, video lesson. So you guys see we have the tube here. We have mercury in here. And remember, it was totally filled with mercury. And so therefore, when you see this space here, after you, and you guys see what happens is, like, you remove your finger, right, from here. What you would normally expect, when you guys expect due to gravity, when you expect all the mercury just come out and fill up the dish and like pour out on the table. But what happens is it will drop a little bit, but then it will just stabilize. So what, the question is, what's holding this mercury, this column of mercury, you guys remember this column of mercury would be pretty heavy. What's holding that mercury suspended in the tube? The answer is atmospheric pressure. You guys, we're surrounded by the atmosphere and gas molecules. They're moving, they're hitting the walls of the container, they're hitting the surface of the mercury and they're exerting a pressure. And so what you can do is, you can measure the atmospheric pressure, the pressure on the outside. Like that, I even have a barometer in the classroom. If you guys show up in class, we'll show you that. Um, and so, would you guys agree? The higher the column of mercury, that the higher the column of mercury, wouldn't that? Wouldn't you agree that that would indicate the stronger or the uh, the higher the atmospheric pressure? The lower the column of mercury, if, the, if your mercury went down to here, then that would indicate that the atmospheric pressure can only support a column of mercury that tall. So what we do is we measure the length of the mercury column to, as an indication of how high or low atmospheric pressure, otherwise known as barometric pressure, is. Okay. Just a couple last things here, guys, along the same lines. Note this, at sea level and zero degrees Celsius, because you guys, it's both temperature and elevation that are going to affect atmospheric pressure. The ad, on average, the atmosphere can push mercury up a column of 760 millimeters high. So if you're at sea level, which we kind of are here at Chula Vista, you guys know we're right near the ocean, zero degrees Celsius, obviously that's lower than uh, you know, 20 or so degrees Celsius, which is your typical room temperature. You would expect a column of mercury to be suspended 760 millimeters high due to the atmospheric pressure under these conditions. Okay? This, therefore, this is called standard pressure. So you guys, we're going to talk about that 760 millimeters of mercury. That's kind of a number that we're going to use a lot. That's considered standard pressure. Okay? So we, we compare other pressures to that, that standard. Okay? Um, and then zero degrees Celsius. Notice the reason why you had to say it, because you guys, if you change the elevation, you're going to change the amount of air that's, you're, the higher you go, the less air you have, the less air you have, the less air pressure. So you have to state what elevation and you have to state the temperature because depending on the temperature, that's going to cause atmospheric pressure to fluctuate. So when we state zero degrees Celsius, that might, if this is called standard pressure, what do you think zero degrees Celsius is called? That is standard temperature. We call that standard temperature. So big T for temperature, big P for pressure. And if we put those two together, and this is something you guys have seen on a previous, some previous fun sheets and I told you guys to ignore. When you guys see both standard pressure and standard temperature, you know what we say? We say STP. That's what STP means, standard temperature and pressure. So if you guys ever come across a problem and it says the conditions are STP, what do you know right off the bat? Oh, you know the, the, the temperature is zero degrees Celsius and you know the pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. All right. So you guys, at this point, that's all we've got for today. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.